If you were to do just a sort of a, a simple little word search on Google and, and do a little bit of research on uh, uh, the origin of nursery rhymes that we teach our kids, you would find that there's often sort of a dark story behind them, isn't there? And there's sort of a dark meaning uh, to it. So for instance, London Bridge, you know, London Bridge is falling down. Um, how many how many have seen that, by the way? It's out in Lake Havasu, Arizona. It's a pretty cool uh, place if you have a chance to go see it. Um, if uh, It was written, I believe, in the 9th or 10th century, and it was about uh, marauding Vikings that were coming to s- supposedly destroy, to try to destroy the bridge. And they conducted child sacrifices with the idea that um, uh, it might, it would, it would ensure the integrity, the structural integrity of the, of the bridge. Now that's sort of a, you know, kind of a sorted, but now, and for all of you kids that might be here today, is, aren't you grateful that in spite of the fact that your, your, your parents may want to kill you, it has nothing to do with the structural integrity of say, the I-74 bridge or the Centennial Bridge. Those bridge, you, your life will be spared and our bridges will be fine. Um, but so it's kind of this dark uh, uh, ring around the rosies, I think was a uh, popular legend has it, that it was written about the great plague in London that, that uh, destroyed f- f- nearly, f- I think, 15% of the population. Others, others uh, speculate that it was really more about a, a ban on dancing in the 9th century by Protestants in Great Britain. So sort of a, a 19th century, you know, footloose thing. You, know, you remember that? <laughs> I'm putting it loose, footloose. <laughs> yeah, silly. The point of it is, there's often sort of this dark undercurrent to any number of these little songs and stories and fables that we, that we teach our kids, isn't there? And we, we don't really always tell them the whole story. We have some of that in our own, in our own culture, our own uh, practice of faith. Um, there's stories in the Bible that we sort of tell in sort of a, a kind of a benign way, but we don't really get to the, some of the other details. One of the stories we're going to look at today, it's an odd story to talk, you know, one week before Christmas, but when you, when you preach as I do, you just sort of grab a book and you preach it in the order it comes, and this is the order that it came, but we're going to look at the, the story of the, the destruction of Jericho. Uh, I think a, a story we all know, you know, the people walked around the, the city once a day uh, for six days, and the seventh day, they walk around it seven times, blow the trumpets, a great shout, and the, the walls tumble down. They, they collapse on themselves. And, this, and a great victory is won. We love to tell that story. We tell it vigorously and robustly to our kids. We put it out in little flannel graphs. We, have, we give them little children's story books and things. And the kids can look through it and see the walls tumbling down, a great shout, great trumpets. But we don't tell the whole story. The rest of the story is that the soldiers came in and killed every man, woman, and child. Genocide. I think of my little grandson, Silas, one years old, who got his head bashed in, throat cut. Your 80-year-old grandma, throat cut. Little boys and girls playing in the street, head caved in. How do we reconcile that? We don't tell that story to our kids, do we? You You don't see that in the coloring book. And yet it's in the Bible. And we have, to, we have to look at it, don't we? We can't just bypass it because we don't like it. We can't just ignore it because we don't like it. The fact of the matter is, people that don't believe in our God often look at these kinds of stories and say, how can you worship a God that would call for genocide? I recently just read, we have some of it in our own culture. Um, I recently read an article of uh, if you study Native American culture, you know that there's some terrible stories just exactly like that of whole villages that were destroyed, three, four, five hundred people, men, women, children. And I just read of this, um, this memorial of, of uh, several uh, uh, soldiers, uh, officers in the, the, the United States Army that wouldn't allow their soldiers. They said, it's too grisly, it's terrible. We're not going to allow our men to shoot and kill and murder unarmed men, women, and children. Even in our own culture, we don't like it. The story's terrible, isn't it? It makes, I wish it wasn't there, but it is there. How do we reconcile that? How do we call ourselves people of faith, merciful, compassionate, loving, just? How do we worship a God that we call merciful, loving, just, and yet there's this grisly, horrible story in the Bible? 
I know, a strange story to look at one week before Christmas, but it just came up. That's the way the Bible sort of unfolds. So we're going to look at it today. We're going to learn some things about God's justice, about his wrath, but also about his grace and his love. We're going to learn how to navigate some difficult terrain. Paul said that all, te- all the Bible is given to us for our instruction, for our, for our reproof. It's for our good. It's to teach us. Um, and this is one of those stories. But we need help, don't we? We need a little bit of help. I think we need some help from the Spirit of God to quicken our hearts and our minds. Don, my prayer partner, prayed for me today as we prayed for this message. He said, you know, Lord, quicken Pastor Jim's mind. I was feeling that talk a little bit, so I prayed that he'd also settle my stomach some. But we need some help with this one. This is a difficult message. If I'm honest, I'd like to sort of just step over it and move on to the next one, but we can't. So let's dig into it and uh, pray that God will uh, teach us some things about who he is. Lord, thank you for your presence in our midst. You're a, you're a, you're a powerful God, an amazing God, and, um, and we need your help this morning. We trust you with the content that we're going to study. It's there for our benefit. So we'll study it, and we'll learn, and we'll grow. But Lord, if we're honest, we have to confess that these are difficult passages that are hard to reconcile with what we know about you and what we know about your grace and and the plan that you have for us for salvation. So help us, God. Help us to stay focused, encourage us, help us to roll our sleeves up and dig into a, a difficult passage, but at the same time, Help us to learn more of your nature, your character, and how we are to respond to you and what our role in the world is. For all of these things, we give you praise. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Joshua 6. I'm going to cover a lot of content, so I'll try to get through it as quickly as we can. Um, As you know, the nation of Israel has just crossed over the Jordan River. Um, they're ready now to, to begin to lay siege to Jericho. All of the preparations have been religious ones. They've been uh, uh, ceremonial. They, they uh, circumcised all the men that had not been sacrificed all, or circumcised through all their uh, traveling in the wilderness, the wandering in the wilderness. Um, they, uh, can I get somebody to close that window right there for me? That's just blinding me. Blinded by the light. That's, that's bright. Thank you. Um, now all of you guys are just little little speckles of like light that I can't quite see your face. They've crossed over and all the men that had been wandering throughout that period of time uh, weren't circumcised. So they circumcised all the men. Um, They uh, celebrated the Passover. So there's all this religious preparation getting ready to uh, lay siege to Jericho. And the the message is clear. This is God's war. He's going to fight it. Um, There are no instructions uh, for military preparations. All the preparations that are made are to be done um, uh, ceremonial and religiously. So in other words, they're sanctifying themselves to be able to to prepare themselves to conduct holy war. This is God's war. So, um, and so with all of that preparation, now is the day. The people are frightened. The people within Jericho are frightened. They're, 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 they have no fight in them. They're fearful. And uh, this is where we pick it up on verse one of chapter six. It says, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Jericho is one of the um, oldest cities that we actually have uh, some, some records of, 8,000 years before Christ. It's been around a long time. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what the city was. But if we go by what, what modern archaeology has unveiled, it's not a huge place. It's maybe about 10 acres. So keep that kind of in your framework um, as we study this. In other words, our property here is eight acres. So it's only slightly larger um, uh, than, than what we have right here. So if, we're, if this was what we're dealing with, and we'll talk more about it, this, this may not have been a gigantic community. This may have been only a few dozen families um, in this relatively small place. So you can imagine there was 40,000 fighting men. If, four, if an army of 40,000 circled around a 10-acre area with a few dozen families in it, you can see why people would be terrified. Um, if that's the case, and we'll look more about that. So people are frightened. Nobody's going in, nobody's going out. Um, Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I've delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and fighting men. 
um, Jericho, uh, the, the Jericho parallels our own understanding of the kingdom. And so one of the things we see in the story a lot, we talked about this in the first week, is that Jericho had already been given and is being given. The same way the kingdom uh, is given to us. We have the kingdom and yet it is still being given. So we always walk in the tension, but the now, but not yet. The kingdom is here and yet it is still coming. Uh, similar to the, 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 same, the same parallel we have with Jericho. I delivered Jericho into your hands along with his king and fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men do this for six days. Having seven pre- have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns and horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city blowing seven times with the priests blowing the trumpet. This, what we're going to see in this is sort of it's awkward phrasing even in English. Um, it's, it's awkward. You're going to kind of see as, as we sort of read through it. But basically, the punchline is a pretty simple one. Um, they're supposed to have priests go in front of them. Uh, they're going to walk all, all around the city. So again, if it's, a, if it's only a 10-acre plot, you can see the impact that would have on, on the inhabitants of it. You're supposed to walk around. The, the trumpets are going to be sounding. Trumpets would be uh, used militarily, but also in praise. The language is the same kind of language that we see in Psalm 150. It says, praise him on the, on the sounding brass. Uh, worship uh, in, for, for the Jewish people, for the Israelites, would be sort of a military exercise as well as worship. The idea, God is our victor, uh, um, Jehovah is the righteous one. And so, so uh, the, the righteous war of Jehovah and worship were all sort of bound together using really similar language. So those are the instructions. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout and the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Uh, Joshua now is going to repeat those instructions to everybody. He says, Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was this box, this gilded box that was central to Israel's worship. I think you know this by now. It was central to the worship. It was, it was where God's presence and his power uh, were focused. It, it, it was symbolic and signified his power and his presence with the people. So the Ark of the Lord uh, was to go before them, have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests. Now, by the way, the Ark of the Covenant doesn't need an armed guard. This is a, uh, the power and the presence of Almighty God. So this is mainly ceremonial. Uh, um, as we're going to see, there's no, there's no uh, necessity to have it protected. And yet uh, Joshua put a, a forward and a rear guard. All this time, the trumpets were sounding. It's a way of communing militarily. Uh, they didn't have walkie-talkies or you know communications. You would you would uh, give instructions when to march, when to stop through the use of trumpets. Uh, but again, that also then uh, uh, doubled it all. It kind of blended together with the way they would worship and the sort of the militant sort of aspect to, to the worship, the victorious God, the conqueror, the coming king, all those types of things. But Joshua would command the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. So imagine this, for six days, the army goes around, there's the sound of the trumpets, they circle the whole city, and then they're just quiet. How long they sit there, I don't know, but that'd be a pretty eerie feeling, wouldn't it? Just sort of sitting there quiet. Then some instructions are given through the trumpets, and then they return back to camp. That would be a little unnerving, I would think. So he had the Ark of the Lord carried around the, the city, circling it once. The army returned to the camp. They spent the night there. Day number one, they do what they're told. The trumpets blow. They kind of circle the city. They just sit there for a while. How long? Presumably all day. And then they return back to their camp. Kind of a strange military plan. Uh, doesn't seem to have a lot of strategy, but seems to be effective in striking fear in the heart of the inhabitants of Jericho. The next day, Joshua got up early the next morning. Their priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord, blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them. The rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and again returned to camp. They did this for six days. So six days, circle, trumpets, Quiet, returned back to camp. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak, marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. They go around seven times this time. 
The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast again, here's this idea, the same sort of language used in uh, 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 Psalm 150 and throughout the Psalms of signifying praise to the Lord. Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So they get this great shout, God's given this to you. And this is Joshua speaking to them. The city and all that it is in, that is, that it is in it are devoted to the Lord. This is a strange concept. It's a, it's a term known as harem. And the, the idea is it's devoted to God for its destruction. Um, in other words, the people couldn't do anything about it. Um, it was, uh, and there was, there's language in, in, in Leviticus. There's also language in Mesopotamian literature and extra biblical literature of this concept of something being devoted to destruction. In other words, there was nothing the people could do. They were powerless to stop this destruction. It was coming. It's devoted to God. You don't have the authority, the power to undo this. Um, it's completely devoted to destruction. It's a, it's a similar kind of idea of us being devoted to God for his goodness, for his grace, for his purposes. These are things that are devoted to God for its destruction. Everything in the city. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in a house shall be spared because she hid the spies out. You remember, you remember the story of the spies. We looked at that at the very beginning. Joshua sends these two young guys in to, to check out the city. Uh, the king of Jericho and his soldiers are looking for him. Uh, they, they, put, they, they find refuge in Rahab's house, uh, who was a, a prostitute, and, and her house was, was built into the city wall, so she's able to hide them. And then when... Um, when uh, the, the, the king sent message saying, where's the spy? She said, well, they already left. And then uh, they were able to escape. So she said, hey, based on that, honor, honor what I've done because I believe in Jehovah and spare my family. So uh, Joshua and his men are keeping uh, their word to her. But keep away from the devoted things. There's that idea, these devoted things. These things are devoted to God, harem, uh, voted, devoted to, uh, for destruction, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on. In other words, you were supposed to stay away from this stuff. It's dangerous. It will, it will be destructive to your family, destructive to the whole, uh, to, to the whole community. Um, we're going to actually look at this after the first of the year. We'll get back into our study and we'll see through the sin of Achan what happened when he took some of the goods he plundered. He didn't obey this commandment. Um, I could preach a whole thing on that and we'll deal more with it, but sin harms people. Um, sin sin lays, uh, leaves behind it a wake of destruction that, that goes on for generations. So he's saying, be very careful. You have to stay away from this stuff. This is dangerous. Um, be obedient. Otherwise, you'll make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and the gold and articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. This is the first time uh, in the nation's history that they're, they're beginning to, to build the treasury. Now, we know that by the time of, of King David and Solomon and even Saul, that by now there had been uh, uh, quite a bit of wealth built up. But this is the beginning of it. But the promise of God to the, the nation of Israel that they're going to have this conquest and God's going to provide everything. God's going to provide the food, the shelter, the water. You're going to live in uh, homes you didn't build and eat the fruit of vineyards you didn't plant. You're going to drink water from wells you didn't dig. And you're also going to gain the benefit of the treasuries of the of the towns and the cities that that you invade that you plunder but it's going to be for funding the rest of this holy war god is providing it in other words they're building a war chest for the first time um, if you were going to drive out the inhabitants of uh, nations you have to have a significant amount of treasury to do so and now they're beginning to build up a war chest to uh, uh, fulfill god's desires if god calls you to do something he'll provide for it and he called the nation of Israel to inhabit this land, and he's giving them the treasury to do so. When the trumpet sounded, now back to the action. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted in the so at the sound of the trumpet. When the men gave a loud shout, the walls collapsed. They just went, pfft, fell right in on themselves. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Men. Women. Young, old, cattle, sheep, donkeys. If it breathed, it died. Let that settle in for a bit. It's horrible. It's devastating. It's tragic. It's wrong. All of those things that we feel, there's a reason we feel that. 
Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brother, her sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver, the gold, and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. See how he keeps kind of coming back to this story of Rahab. Keep that uh, kind of in a, tack that in your mind here for a second. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. This is being written several hundred years after this actual event. So he's not saying that Rahab is now, you know, 500 years old. He's saying that her family and her, uh, her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren are still amongst the Israelites. At that time, Joshua pronounced a solemn oath, cursed, be, cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild the city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundation. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up the gates. In other words, if you rebuild it, your children will die. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. By the way, um, that actually happened to a man named Hiel who, who tried to rebuild uh, the city during the reign of Ahab, and he uh, lost his, both of his sons uh, in doing so. So it's a, it's a grisly story, isn't it? One that makes us wince, one that uh, we wish probably wasn't there if you're like me and you read it, but it is there, so we have to kind of dig into it. And if we're gonna understand something that's complicated, the only way to really understand it is sort of to roll our sleeves up and dig in a bit to see if we can say, well, what's, what's really happening and how do we understand it? And the first thing we have to understand is, is this, is this really an actual story? Is this, did this really happen? And if you remember when we began our series, we talked about how we approach um, the the interpretation of God's word. And and many modern theologians and more liberal scholars would say, we're going to take a minimalistic approach. In other words, if it's it's not specifically proven in archaeology or in um, extra biblical literature, we have to discount it. Uh, So in other words, the Bible doesn't stand on its own as a historical piece of evidence. Now, I don't, most uh, orthodox theologians don't believe that, and, and I don't believe that either. Uh, I believe that even if we take from it the spiritual content of the Bible, which of course we can't do as, as people of faith, but if we were, the Bible still stands on its own merit as a reliable piece of historical data. So there are some things in the Bible that don't always seem to square, but when we look at extra biblical resource at our archaeology and we combine it with what we know about the Bible, you can begin to put together a reliable narrative and I believe we can do that here. Um, we already looked at when it was written or when, it, when these events took place and because of timelines within scripture itself and other archaeological data uh, in terms of historical data of surrounding Uh, nations, including Egypt. We looked at some of that stuff. We don't need to kind of unpack all of it, but we know that these events happened about 13, about 1500 to 1300 years before the the time in the life of Christ. So that's our window of when these events happened. Um, And, and the, and in the thirties, there was, uh, uh, archaeologists began to uncover uh, a lot of artifacts around that region and determined that this was an actual, there was enough archaeological data to say, yes, this actually did happen around 1,400 years before Christ, so it kind of fits right in that window, and this is a reliable story that can be proven from the archaeological record. Um, A few decades after that, another study came out that said, well, we can't really trust that, and probably uh, looking at different data, uh, this one gal, she dated it quite a bit Uh, before that, uh, 1,500 to 2,500 years uh, beyond that. And she determined that, this study determined that there was a large, powerful, vibrant community that would sort of fit the narrative that we see, but that it was quite a bit earlier and there had already been massive war and destruction that decimated that community and in fact made it so that nobody actually lived in the region for several hundred years. So the region that, that this story takes place, according to the second archaeological finding, there nobody lived there, it was uninhabited, for hundreds of years. So between 15 and 1300 uh, BC, there was nobody living there at all. So these events couldn't have taken place because there was no Jericho. 
Then more recently, another study came out where they conducted a lot of uh, carbon dating and then kind of went back to the 1930s date and say, no, it is reliable with with carbon dating to the 14th, uh, 14th century BC, but the community may not have been so large. It may have been just a smaller community, kind of similar to the property we have here with houses that, that went around the perimeter, which would constitute the wall, um, which then would, would be consistent with why Rahab had, a, had a, um, uh, an inn. It, hers would be part of these contiguous houses that went around the perimeter. And uh, that's, what, that's what's, was, what was happening. So if that's the case, it, it does sort of shape this story because this is not... This, this might be a few dozen families. This is certainly not hundreds of people, certainly not thousands or tens of thousands. It's a small community with houses that go around the perimeter um, that 40,000 soldiers went around, which would obviously strike terror in the hearts. And so it's not quite maybe as a grand a story as we, as we maybe think of it when we read through it. Um, and then, uh, but there was something there, something happened. And then there's actually a fifth, a fifth scenario that says this, the, the, the actual place of Jericho was likely a few miles from where, modern, where we see it in the modern day. And uh, the fact is, it probably is eroded away. It's eroded, all the evidence is lost, and there's actually no record of the biblical Jericho. Now, there's merit to, to some or all of that, but you can see that the archaeological data is really inconclusive, right? So based on just the archaeological data, you can say, well, there was something there, but we don't really know what. So we really actually have to then take scripture and put to it to get a little bit of a better uh, scenario. But we can conclude this. Something happened. Something happened. Whether it was a few dozen families, a few hundred families, a few thousand families, tens of thousands of families, a hundred thousand, we don't know, but something happened. And if we kind of defer back to the biblical account, it was fairly impressive. So I lean more to say that, uh, that this was probably a community that we don't have an archaeological uh, record of, but there was something that went on there, and we can trust the biblical account to it. Whatever we see it, whether it's a few dozen or a few hundred or a few thousand, something happened that was awful. It's awful if a few dozen people get killed. It's awful if, you know, thousands of people get killed. Uh, genocide. So what do we do with it? Well, there's, I think there's five solutions. The first solution is do what we tend to do with it, just sort of ignore it. We tell the parts of the story that we like and we ignore, we ignore the rest of it. But then that's not really being faithful to the Bible that we say uh, rules our life, right? So the Bible is the rule of faith and practice. It's where we learn who we are, who God is, how we're supposed to behave and act. So I don't think we can just ignore it. The second scenario is... Um, we say it's not true. It's just stories that were concocted, and there's no evidence for it, so we just don't really believe it. But as I've just sort of explained, there actually is quite a bit of evidence, enough evidence to explore it. You know, I think there's enough data to say, no, this is a, there's enough evidence, and it's a serious enough issue. We need to explore the content of it. So I don't think we can just dismiss it. Third, third solution might be to say, as some have, they've, they've, they've suggested this is rhetoric, uh, it's wartime rhetoric for a warlike community that was probably written around the 7th century BC, which is during the time of Josiah's reign. And for those of you who are Old Testament scholars, you remember that at the time of Josiah, there was great renewal, great national renewal. Josiah's rebuilding the nation. He's reinstituting uh, uh, religious law. He's doing all these wonderful things. And as part of the reform, as part of the religious reform, he's, he's, he's written this, this narrative to create fear in the heart of the people so that they will honor and respect and obey God. So he tells this sort of grisly story to, to elevate the way they see God, to elevate the way they see their history, and it's, it's just sort of a political and mil military rhetoric. Um, it might feel pretty good to do that because we get to sort of bypass this terrible story, but in the end, the content is still the same. Bad people, enemies of God, get their skulls crushed, little babies, old women, everybody dies. So even though it might, we might be able to avoid the actual scenario, the content is still the same, and further, there's no biblical evidence for it. There's, there doesn't seem to be any connection at all between Josiah and Joshua, so they're just... It's a connection that might make us feel better about the story, but in the end doesn't have a lot of uh, theological or historical weight. So I think we have to discount that. The fourth scenario I think is, uh, is helpful, and what the fourth scenario says is we look at it um, 
the content of this story and how it describes God is so out of character with the rest of the biblical narrative, we have to see it as unique to itself. In other words, we don't build our entire theology of God based on this one event. Uh, if we did, we'd have to conclude that God's a pretty terrible God, wouldn't we? Um, there's something going on here. And, in, and we know a little bit about what's going on. The wickedness at this time, this is before the time of Christ, this is before the giving of the Holy Spirit. God's, God's narrative redemption is confined to a small little uh, uh, traveling people. It, it's, it's not this worldwide thing. Jesus has not come. The Holy Spirit hasn't been given. The world is a dark place. And so the sin of the Canaanite, the Canaanite people was so vast and so severe that it provoked God. In fact, several years before this story happened, God is talking to Moses and he's saying, you have to wait until we read about it in Leviticus. You have to wait until all of the transgressions have unfolded until the, the weight of the Canaanite sin uh, is complete so that then uh, their, their destruction can be fulfilled. Um, and there's a list of it, including bestiality and child sacrifice and things, things of that nature that we would find objectionable in our own culture. So, so whatever the case was, the, the sin of this generation of this people deepened and deepened and deepened and deepened to a point that God said there is no redemption for, for this people, and they are, they're devoted to their destruction. They're given to me for destruction. Um, but we don't know all of it. Why was, why was redemption not offered? Why, what had they done? What was the depth of it? I just, I don't know. I just, the, the, the narrative doesn't include those things, but we know that it was deep, it was dark, it was intense, and you could not walk back from it. Um, but again, it's isolated to this group, and in fact, um, it's, it's not the narrative of the Old Testament. The, old, the narrative of the Old Testament is the God that ends wars. The, 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 the words that we say, wonderful counsel, the prince of peace, are from Isaiah. These are, these are words that describe uh, Christ, the, the giver of peace, love, reconciliation, those types of things. So we have to look at it just as a unique circumstance happening in these regions and not a mandate for all time. We do that with a lot of uh, t uh, issues in the Bible. One issue regarding women in ministry, for instance, we look at the overall arching role of women in ministry, and we see that there's a narrative that women were used in the highest levels of leadership, but there's a couple of problematic verses in Corinthians and in uh, Titus and, and 1 Timothy that say women shouldn't teach and they should keep quiet in services, etc., etc. But we don't build a whole theology on a few problematic verses. Um, we, we say those are unique issues happening in Corinth and Ephesus, and we see that in light of um, sort of this narrow perspective. The same thing can be done with Jesus' power. It is said that as he passed through some villages, he was limited in his power. He couldn't do any miracles because of the lack of faith in the people. Well, we don't build a whole theology on Jesus' power based on this one verse, this one, this one narrative. Um, it's unique. There was something happening there. We don't understand all of it, but we know that Jesus was powerful and could conduct miracles whenever he wanted to. But this was this, there was some restraint. We don't understand all of it. So in other words, it's not unusual for us us to say, well, this is a bit of an aberration. We don't really understand everything, but we don't build our whole theology on God based on this one narrative. It's a terrible narrative. We don't understand it fully, but it's not the God presented entirely in scripture. And I think that's a, I think that's a workable thing. Again, though, we don't, we don't discount the story just because it's inconsistent. We have to see it in light of that. We go, well, that's inconsistent. There's something for us to learn here, but it doesn't frame up my entire understanding of who God is. The fifth scenario, I think, is the most helpful. And I'm not a linguist, but even as we read it um, in English, it's choppy, it's awkward. The narrative, the, the narration sort of struggles. It's as if the person writing it is also having as much trouble writing it as we are reading it. He sort of goes through the, the grisly, awful places pretty quickly, and he keeps coming back to the narrative of grace, of Rahab. Rahab found grace. She found grace. She found grace. We're going to look at a few chapters about the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites sort of found a way around the sentence of death. They learned, they figured out a way, they found grace. Um, in fact, the matter is, is, is that most of the inhabitants of, of, uh, of Canaan escaped this disaster. There was only three cities that were destroyed. It was only uh, Jericho, Ai, and Hazor. All of the rest of them somehow avoided this uh, particular scenario, even though the mandate was that they kill everybody. 
So somehow people found grace, and as the person is writing it, that, and we don't know who he was, but he, the, the Deuteronomist, the one that also wrote Deuteronomy, he's struggling to sort of get the words out. It's as if he wants us to understand there was this terrible event that's hard for me to wrap my brain around, but people found grace. In other words, they died, they perished because of the hardness of their heart. They rejected the narrative, the story of grace. Now, that's not altogether satisfactory. How can a little child receive or reject grace? You know, a child is a child. But it at least underscores the depth and the destruction of sin. It's deep, it's dark, it's permeative, and it impacts everybody and leaves a path of destruction behind it. And I've seen it again and again and again and again. What do we do with it? First thing is this. When you read the story, it should fill you with a profound sense of, gr- of grief. This should grieve us in the deepest parts of our, of our hearts. How can humanity have fallen to such a place, to such a dark place that everybody died? Men, women, children, everybody. It should fill us with deep grief knowing that, that Jericho, the narrative of Jericho, is just a little picture of what is coming to all of humanity. Because even though we don't want to talk about it, the reality is God is coming with wrath. The Bible says he's pouring out his wrath on all the world. At the same time, he will pour out his mercy for those who are his children and will be spared. But the wrath is coming. The judgment is coming. It's, and it's, it's sad, isn't it? But it's coming. And every one of us here have people in our families who will not be spared. And they will forever endure the torment of hell, of death, of separation from God. Whatever all of that looks like, we don't have an entirely clear picture. The Bible doesn't need to give us one. It's terrible, it's eternal, and it doesn't end. And people that we love will suffer this endless death for all eternity. And it's almost as if God is giving this little picture of what this looks like. And it is just as bad as we think it is. Everywhere our mind goes when we think of the destruction of Jericho, it's as bad as we think it is and worse. And yet it's coming now in eternity for all mankind separated from God. So whatever feeling it evokes in you as you're reading it, it's supposed to evoke those feelings because that's what's coming. That is what's coming. So it should fill us with sorrow. Sin is terrible. Sin is destructive. It will harm you and it will harm people that you love, even to death. So it should create in us great sorrow. It should also create in us a great sense of urgency, shouldn't it? If I knew destruction was coming, Rahab knew destruction was coming, she did something. She went to her family, says, you've got to be in my house or you're going to die. And yet we know destruction is coming and often we do nothing, don't we? Well, I'll be embarrassed, God. I'll feel silly. I'll feel foolish. I've already told them, but they don't believe. And yet we know what's coming, don't we? It doesn't matter if they believe it or not, it's still coming. And in fact, Peter, writing about that, he goes to great detail of what this is going to look like. He said, God's not lazy. He's not slack. He's not up taking a nap. He says, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Every moment that God delays his coming, the judgment, every moment is an opportunity for somebody to come to faith to avoid the destruction that's going to happen similar to the the destruction that happened in Jericho. Every day that God tarries is another day for people to avoid the catastrophe of God's wrath. Because it's coming. We probably need to talk a little bit more about it, don't we? So it should create in us a sense of urgency. For this generation of Israelites, there was a sense of urgency. They hastened across the water. They got up early in the morning. They didn't wait to obey God. They, They got circumcised. They celebrated Passover. They moved with urgency. 
because the days were short. I fear for this generation sometimes because I don't, I don't know that I see the urgency. It's like we don't believe the wrath is coming. We love God's grace. But how can we understand God's grace if we don't understand his justice? The fact is we can't, can we? If we don't know what we're being saved from, how can we ever truly be saved? And what we're being saved from is the wrath shown in Jericho. That's what we are saved from. Everybody. So it should create a sense of urgency. So it should create in us a sense of deep sorrow. Sin is terrible. And a great sense of urgency. God is eternal. His time is eternal. We are not. Now we will, we will live in eternity with him, but our time on planet earth is numbered, isn't it? We live in minutes, in hours, days, weeks, months, years. We're not here forever. And the things that we do or the things that we don't do bear eternal significance. It will impact you. It will impact the people that you love. So we need to move with a sense of urgency, don't we? Perhaps there's no better time than this season of peace and joy. Jesus came so we don't have to suffer what the the people of Jericho suffered. Jesus came to bring peace to the world. What better time to tell people? Maybe what better time to preach a message like this than Christmas, the season of Advent, where we recognize Jesus came to fix this problem. And here's the third thing. So sorrow, urgency, and at the same time, extraordinarily and extreme gratitude. And this is perhaps the most important aspect of this. Maybe we don't understand God's wrath. Maybe these things are hard for us to understand because we've never seen it. You will never see God's wrath. Never. Maybe that's why we struggle to understand it. We've never seen it. We never will. For God to demonstrate his wrath towards his children, we've been saved, would be inconsistent with who God is. He'd he'd be breaking his own word. So you will never see God's wrath. Sometimes we think we do things and we think we've really honked God off and God's up in heaven. No. God always sees you through the person and the work of his son, Jesus. Always. He always sees you with grace. He always sees you with love. Now, we sometimes walk in sinful behavior, and that keeps us from understanding the fullness of who we are and the fullness of his love and his grace towards us. So then we feel indictment. We feel pain. We feel frustration. We feel depression. We feel lots of things, but that's us doing it. That's not God. That's because we're walking in disobedience. But when we walk in obedience and holiness, we enter into the fullness of who we are, of who God is. We experience the full capacity of his love and his grace towards us. In other words, sometimes when we feel God is distant, it's not because God's gone anywhere, it's because we've gone somewhere. But you will never, ever feel the weight of God's wrath. You never will. You've never seen it. I've never seen it. I think that's why we need these stories because we need to know it's there. God's justice is there. It's coming. But we're spared that. Maybe here's a story that can help us understand it. I'm a storyteller, you know that. Stories help us understand some things. When I was a, a boy, maybe 14 or 15 years old, I had a friend of mine whose dad was an ex-Marine, kind of a special ops guy. He's a tough guy. He'd seen active combat. Um, But we only knew him as just a kind, gentle, loving, hardworking, good father, good guy. That's all all we ever knew about him. He was a fun guy to be around. So one day there, him and his family, I didn't see the event. He told me about it. One day they're at a park, him and his family, and they're just enjoying a day in the park, a little barbecue. And close by, there were some young people that were drinking too much and misbehaving, and they started harassing his little family, you know, making comments. And, and, and he kept telling them to, you know, back off, keep it down. And things escalated and escalated. He, the, the young people didn't do it. The guys didn't do it. They kept, until it kind of got dangerous. He said, my dad got up, and he just started swinging haymakers. And he whooped up on him good. I mean, they went to the hospital 
he, he whooped up on him good. And uh, my friend said, I had never seen my dad like that. I'd never seen the level of violence, the, ang- the level of anger that, God, that, that his dad leveled on those young men. That's how our God is. You will never see God's anger, but it's there. You will never see his justice, his wrath, that, that is going to be poured out on humanity, but it's there, and it's coming. It's coming. So there's no time like now. You know, the language of Scripture is now's the day, today's the day. Don't wait another minute. You may be sitting there thinking to yourself, what does this mean for me? What well, I'm going to tell you what it means for me, for you. You need to move, and you need to move now. You need to make a bold commitment to Jesus. You need to follow him with your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. You need to get baptized. You need to commit to the family of God. You need to learn and grow, serve, do all the things that the Bible says to do. You need to do it. And I could march you up here and we could do an altar call and there might be some value to that, but in the end, that's not what's gonna save you. The saving you is the commitment that you're gonna make to be a Jesus follower and you're gonna do it today. You're gonna walk away from sinful behavior because it separates you from God keeps you from walking in the fullness of his love and his grace. You need to recognize, as I do, that God is a powerful God and he's a just God and his wrath on humanity is coming. But that's why he sent Jesus, a little baby, the king of kings coming to his creation to fix that problem. We will always live in this tension, won't we? This tension of God's love and his grace and his justice and his wrath because those are real concepts. The people in Jericho were simply unwilling to yield, to submit. We don't like to use that language in the church, but nobody ever gets saved without submitting to the Lordship of Christ. The idea that I'm saved but he's not my Lord is a false narrative. Salvation without submission does not exist. It just does not exist. You must submit to Christ. In fact, in Philippians, it says that there's a time coming that every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess. Those strange, miraculous beings in in the heavenlies and the creatures on earth and below the earth, every creature ever created has to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And they will. And that day is coming. It will either be a day of great joy for those of us that know him, but a day of great terror and judgment for those that don't. But they will submit too. Everybody submits. Maybe there's no better time than the Christmas season to share that love of Christ. There should be a sense of urgency in our heart. Shouldn't there? I mean, Jesus, after all, is the Prince of Peace. He came to fix this problem, this tension that we all live in, this tension of uh, living in a world that's fallen and yet grace is given. Here's how Paul wrote about it in in, uh, Romans. He said, the whole earth is groaning like a woman giving birth, waiting for that day when the problem of sin is finished. That's why Jesus came. But we're still in it, aren't we? And you see the ravages of sin everywhere in our life. It leaves a path of destruction behind us. And yet Jesus is the solution. So let's look at a story like this and let it do those three things. Deep, deep, deep penetrating sorrow for people who will perish and suffer the fate of the inhabitants of Jericho. A sense of urgency for those in our family, people in our communities, uh, so that they don't have to have God's wrath poured out on them. And finally, profound gratitude. I think Christmas should be the time that we say, we know why you came. You came to fix the problem of Jericho. And I'm grateful for it. Let's let those three things guide us through this holiday season. I know that was a weird message for a Christmas uh, season, right? But a good one, one we need to hear.
Y'all have a great day and drive home safely. The weather's getting a little bit better and enjoy the rest of this holiday season. Live with faithfulness, live with urgency, gratitude, and sorrow for the loss. God bless y'all. Just to know you sing and to hold you